BioBalance HealthCast episode 144, Growth Hormones. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Do you remember the musical The Music Man? Yeah. Of Do you course. remember the opening overture? Yeah. Where, where the, they're, all the salesmen are on the train mm -hmm. and they're singing about this Professor Harold Hill who sells boys' bands on credit. And oh, then yeah. they do this whole thing about cash for the merchandise, mm -hmm. cash for the... And, and the whole point of that song, the reason I mention it is... <laughs> I was going to say, it, how It's about the, the resistance to change. Do things the way things have always been mm -hmm. done. And there is an inherent resistance to change in most human systems. Mm -hmm. And in medicine, there is an inherent resistance to change. Mm -hmm. And so today we're going to be talking about trying to overcome the resistance to change about the understanding and usage of growth hormones mm -hmm. as a treatment, uh, both for athletics uh, and, and its abuse and misuse there, mm -hmm. and as a treatment for the elderly, the, as what, a what's called real a fragile treatment. elderly. Yeah, as a real treatment. And the, the pol political uh, changes and manipulations that have occurred over the last 20 years mm -hmm. uh, as this knowledge has become more commonly available and as doctors have begun to experiment with using it and had to overcome resistance. Mm -hmm. You know, the research will tell us that in the beginning when people started to say, well, you know, the elderly might benefit from growth hormone replacement. Well, let's the, talk about growth hormone. Okay, let's, let's talk, talk about, about that. First of all, what is it? Maybe we should what define our it? terms. So growth, growth hormone is uh, a hormone from your pituitary gland and when we are growing, it makes our bones grow, it builds our muscles, it makes us become an adult. So our highest levels are when we're children and as we become an adult. At 20 something, it starts decreasing. And by 40, some of us notice a, a, a significant decrease in growth hormone. What that does is it decreases our muscle mass, increases our fat mass, impairs our ability to think clearly. It also it also makes us feel exhausted or tired, and our, it's an anabolic hormone, just like testosterone. Do you think it, it declines in our 40s because for so many centuries that was our life expectancy at the outer limit? We were really made to live to the end of our uh, ability to have children, so yeah, 40. That's that, and menopause was earlier then, so 40-something right. was it. So as we were supposed to get old and die after we had children, and we've talked about that before. Get off the stage and quit consuming resources. Right, growth, yeah. hormone, growth hormone goes down because then we became a drag to society. Mm -hmm. Well, that hasn't, doesn't happen anymore. Now, now, as we get older, we, if we are healthy, we are the memory for society, we are the experience. Mm -hmm. And so many of us are using the, the information we gathered and we, we actually benefit society. So it's well, yeah, not something- We have something... all the disposable income. That's... Those young twerps need our stuff. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they just want to inherit it. Yeah, I'm just exactly. We, we both have young people. Yeah. Anyway, um, growth hormone is something that is vital to a healthy human being. Now, several things besides age interfere with this. Chronic illness, any chronic illness, can cause you to decrease growth hormone. And so, therefore, you get sicker after, during this chronic illness. If, you have, um, if you're in the hospital for anything, even if it's an infection, your growth hormone drops. Okay. It's in response to your cortisol going up. That makes your growth hormone. There's lots of interactions, but, but basically that's all you have to remember. If, you, if you're sick or if you have an, an auto accident. No matter what your age is. No matter what your age is, okay. your growth hormone drops. And so you become more frail when you're in the hospital for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things that we notice. Also, if you have a head injury, then the pituitary gets shocked and does not make as much growth hormone. So therefore, we become frail from that and we don't feel well and, and our, our joy of living goes away, quality of living goes away. So many things hinge on growth hormone. I'm, I don't use growth hormone because I have such a great treatment in giving people testosterone which then stimulates growth hormone. Mm -hmm. So I don't have to use it because pellet testosterone stimulates growth hormone all on its own. So you can rejuvenate the natural production of growth hormone. Yes. 
through the administration of the bioidentical testosterone, testosterone. pellets. Right. Uh, and that's, that's ideal because the side effects of, uh, say, someone's dose too high on growth hormone, we don't get the side effects because the body is managing it and it doesn't, go, it doesn't increase too high. So we don't have acromegaly, which is like the bones of your face grow and look craggy and you look kind of angular. That's, if you, that's one of the side effects of taking too much growth hormone. Mm -hmm. So, and, and too much growth hormone is not good, just like too much of any hormone is not good. So I find it ideal to use testosterone to stimulate uh, growth hormone in the normal range for both women and men. So basically that's what growth hormone does and it's a natural hormone and it is something that we've, we've had and we lose as we age, especially in our 70s. That seems to be the critical period where even if we give testosterone, sometimes growth hormone decreases. Mm -hmm. So the treatment with growth hormone is the controversy, not the treatment with testosterone. That's not, right. that's not considered a, a, a problem at, at this point. Well, and the treatment with growth hormone is a controversy because in the 1980s, it began to be used and abused by athletes. And, right. and anabolic steroids. Uh, there's an article in the Journal of Clini Clinical Endocrinology. Endocrinology and Metabolism. And Metabolism. Thank that's, you. The that's the journal for endocrinologists. In, in June of this year, 2013. And it discusses the evolution of the usage of growth hormone as, as physicians and endocrinologists understand it and try to use it. And one of the points the author makes is that not all good inventions are made by scientists and doctors. That mm -hmm. sometimes people out of the middle of nowhere come up with something that becomes revolutionary. And so you know, we shouldn't just look at research labs as, as a place to get information. And he goes on to describe that what began to happen in the 1980s is that athletes and their coaches would create what's called a trial of one which is not a, a large study mm -hmm. with a large population and rigorous boundaries and protocols, but they, athletes who, at a high performance level, international competitive athletes, know their performance vectors to within seconds and millimeters. Mm -hmm. And so if you can change a variable, if you can take more orange juice, or you can take growth hormone, mm -hmm. or you can take some steroid or some activity, and then do a test uh, competition, you can attribute any change to that particular variable. Mm -hmm. So they would do a trial of one and a trial of one, trying to find some stub substance that would give them an edge. And what began to happen is that in the, in the early and mid 1980s, internationally competitive athletes were being banned and losing their awards and so on because they tested positive for these substances. Right. And then some doctors began to say, well, if those substances work in that way for these athletes, in terms of uh, increasing the maximization of oxygen, increasing mm -hmm. muscle strength, increasing bone. lean body mass. And bones. And bone density. Ability uh, to get strength. around. Yeah. Thinking. Then, then perhaps that could be a useful treatment for what was called the fragile elderly. Mm -hmm. So they began to experiment with giving it to the elderly. But then the politicians got involved. Yeah. And they got involved mainly because of the outrage over sports. And but the, the elderly of... are not competitive <laughs> athletes. I mean, no. this is a whole different subset of the population. And what frail, why frailty is so important is that the minute you start losing muscle mass and bone, you end up being taken care of by someone else. It's so it's costly. Spiral. You know, it, 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 they say exercise. If you become frail, your ability to exercise is limited, which affects your balance. You fall, you break a leg. I mean, more old people die because they break a bone and get pneumonia and die than for other reasons. But their balance is, it is affected by their growth balance, hormone and their testosterone. Strength, yeah, all of that. Right. We go back to testosterone. If you, so what began to happen then is that in 1993, the federal government passed a restriction that said you cannot use growth hormone except in very limited ways that are authorized solely by the Secretary of Health and Human Services. So this, one person decides. This connects back to our previous two podcasts about Senate Bill 959, mm -hmm. because they are trying to do the same thing now with testosterone mm -hmm. that they did with human growth hormones in the 1990s. So you have a politician, 
an appointed, non-elected politician who unilaterally decides through their own judgment and bias. Who aren't not, doctors. Not from the science, not from the research, not from uh, objective criteria. They have the authority subjectively to say, you can't use this unless I tell you you can use this. And so what happens then is that physicians are no longer allowed to use their training and medical judgment to say, I'd like to try this drug to treat this illness. It's, it's uh, an off-label treatment, right? but I think it might be beneficial. Those usages are limited by law, and if you violate them, you can be punished. You can you be could go to jail. You can be fined. If you prescribe growth hormone for someone who needs it. Except there's a workaround. And yeah. the workaround is in the diagnostic label. And, and my wife was looking at this article. She saw it laying on the table this morning before I came in. And she said, oh, you're going to be talking about idiots today. And I said, no, <laughs> look, look closer. Idio, idiopathic. It's idiopathic. <laughs> if the doctor says this is an idiopathic diagnosis, mm -hmm. idiopathic is a medical term that means we don't know what the cause is, uh, and, and so we don't know suddenly something's gone wrong. Mm -hmm. We can't put a label on it and say, oh, you have cancer, or oh, this is, you know. You've had a head your injury. Liver. Yeah. So. If so, it's anti, and or if it's aging. Yeah. That's, that's a label, too, so you can't say that. Yeah. You have to say it's idiopathic. It's idiopathic because the FDA and the Secretary of, Human, uh, of Health and Human Services has said you can't use this for anti-aging medicine. Okay, so here's the deal. Doctors go to school for this. They've take, they're taking away our power one drug at a time. Mm -hmm. I mean, power to take, make people better. All of those, I, I always found that when I took tests for boards, many of my answers were wrong because I was 10 years ahead. I, I got in my first uh, oral boards, I was taking ovaries out with a laparoscope. And they dinged me for that. But 10 years later, that was the standard of care. Standard of care. Yeah. And I was having great results with it. And they thought that was just a terrible thing. And they criticized me for doing something that was 10 for years doing ahead. Something new and off the radar, which goes back to the music because, band. <laughs> Cash for the merchandise. Right. But it's, it's one of those things that that's what doctors are chosen for. I, I mean, I know that you probably know this, but you you don't just say, I want to be a doctor and get C's or B's, and you don't just decide you want to go to med school. You have to be chosen. You have to be at the very top of your graduating class mm -hmm. in college, really and you have to take the hardest classes, basically the hardest classes in any, any college curriculum. So the competition is huge. You don't make it unless you're really smart So and ethical. And so if you're going to learn to do this stuff and then someone says, you're done, you have to follow this, this little, an um, not anagram, but um, this grid. You cannot do this. You cannot do this. You cannot do this. Right. Well, then I'm looking at a patient in front of me. I know 10 things I can do for them, but all of which. Illegal or off-label. Or, yeah, or yeah. are not suggested mm -hmm. for that reason. They're suggested for another reason. So then if they take away our off-label ability, then they might as well just have a computer sitting in front of you because a computer will give you whatever drug it is without considering anything about you or knowing you or looking at your past history or your family history. So all of these things we're trained to do and governmental agencies don't want us to have power <laughs> and they don't want patients to have power. I'm afraid, I mean, they want to save money. Saving money is not helped by allowing people to be sick all the time. Then you just take you use up more of the money for medical care. It well, makes no sense. There are horror stories about doctors run amok. Well, uh, that's true. But jo Joseph Mengele is an example. <laughs> well, uh, really? Well, really. Because I mean, part of, the, part of the agenda here is to say politically, politically, we don't want you to be a guinea pig of some doctor who doesn't have good ethics or good standards. Well, that's you don't true. want to go into an office and have the doctor say, you know what, I'd like to try something new here and maybe become rich and famous. So I'm going to try this. Without any background or exactly. without any research. So you walk a fine line between honoring the training and, and expecting the judgment and the involvement that the physician brings to the table. Mm -hmm. And what you and I have always talked about in our podcast is the importance of that relationship with the physician and the patient. Mm -hmm. That you as a physician need to know that person. You need to know their health history. You need to know their background, their lifestyle. You need to know them which means you have to spend some time with them. Mm -hmm. And when you're doing mass-produced volume medicine of six minutes per, no matter what the presenting issue is, and, and running 5,000 people a day through your office, 
you and that's not the do doctor's that. choice. They have to do that to stay in business mm -hmm. because the insurance companies run that. You know, there's just 14 yeah, to 15 <laughs> federal agencies that run your doctor's conflicts. office. Yeah, exactly. And we have to be aware of all of them at all times and follow all the rules. Well, it's really hard to practice medicine like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. so, so for the 2% of doctors who are Joseph Mengele's, yeah. who should never have gotten yes, into med school absolutely. anyway, who should, who should be have their license removed because they're, they have a psychiatric disease or they, or they just have a they're, so, they're, socio, they're, they're a sociopath. They're psychiatrist too. I know. Oh, okay. That's who went in. Um, excuse me. <laughs> I almost said that on camera. You almost did. And yep. anyway, so, um, <laughs> so that's, so why don't, let's police, and I don't mean send to jail, I just mean police, and, yeah. and doctors do, there's, there are boards in every state that but police systems, doctors. Bureaucratic systems work that way. It's easier to make a standard rule saying you can't than to allow power disruptions of people trying things on their own. You're the historian. I don't. I mean, I don't really know, but I know. And I know when you say it's, history does that all the time. It does, and and there's natural rhythms of that, and for fighting that that occur, and so you are on the leading edge of the fight mm -hmm. that says we are dedicated. You you and physicians like you to the proposition that you don't have to get decrepit and old and die in misery and pain. And in a nursing you, home for the 10 years. You will get old and you will die, but you can live a fully functional life for almost all of that time if we can do certain things. Mm -hmm. And the thing that you advocate most strongly at this point in the research and, and your 11 years of experience doing it back you up mm -hmm. is the replacement of testosterone as the mm -hmm. first uh, line of defense mm -hmm. against the deterioration of aging. Right. And the argument today is the same. Rather than apply growth hormones to the elderly, mm -hmm. your strategy is to apply testosterone, both to men and women. Right. And then through the testosterone replication, the original body manufacturer of growth hormone reoccurs. Right. It goes up and we get leaner and stronger and more able to take care of ourselves. Our brain works better. So we are effectively healthier. Mm -hmm. And many of my patients lose medication. They don't need as many medications. They don't have, to, they don't have chronic illnesses. Their uh, autoimmune disorders get better. Well, this happens as well with the other anabolic steroid, which is growth hormone. But what happens is testosterone works up to a certain point. Yeah. And then as people get over the 75 mark, right. you it's have not to, enough it's itself. not enough. Yes. So, and that's when you're at risk for really decreasing, becoming frail. If you look yeah. at people who aren't on any, any hormones, you know their age, they're great. And then they hit either they hit 75 or 80. And then all of a sudden they get skinny. My mother loved it. She was like, oh, look how thin I am. I'm like, yeah. oh my gosh, you have no muscle. Yeah. You know, but I didn't, but of course I didn't say that. Right. But um, but she was becoming frail, and so in in the anorexic world of the 1960s, that was that was in her brain a great thing. It's well, not good for you to but do Kathy, that. You know, personally, that there are people out there, even medical professionals, that we both know mm -hmm. in this community where we mm -hmm. live and work, nurses and doctors, some of whom say you're a charlatan and a quack. Yeah. That what you do is is bogus medicine. And mm -hmm. some of whom say, you've saved our lives and you've saved our mm -hmm. patients' lives. Mm -hmm. You know that over the last 10 years, as you have begun to do this in this marketplace, uh, neurologists, endocrinologists, who initially said, ah, that's bogus, are now sending you their patients mm -hmm. because they see the results that you gain. Mm -hmm. And you have, to, <laughs> you have to get up every day and do what you do because you believe in it and know that there are people out there that will challenge you and label you positively or negative, mm -hmm. you're a saint or a devil, mm -hmm. and not give that any energy because mm -hmm. your focus is on the patient that you treat and the science that you learn that helps you treat other patients. Mm -hmm. And that's what doctors, I believe and you believe, ought to be doing. And we, sh we should the, be looking for another answer. The bureaucratic system <laughs> for the problems is that we, what it is. That and patients so, have. So the answer that they have found for growth hormone and the ability to use it in treatment of the elderly is the term idiopathic. It's an idiopathic event. I'd still be afraid to write it. Yeah. I'd be afraid well, I'd be, be afraid to I mean this one drug has has the consequence of going to jail if you write it. Right. 
if you write it inappropriately. Inappropriately, off-label. but that it doesn't guarantee that they won't throw you in jail if you write it for idiopathic. And, no, they don't, they don't no, there say is no that. Guarantee. There's no Nobody's guarantee. Nobody's just crossed that line. So yet. I'm, I'm, I would be afraid to write this drug. Yeah. And I know that there are people who are not afraid to write this drug, but for me, it's a better answer to do the testosterone, which is very low in any kind of side effects and very high in making everybody feel better and growth hormone go up. So, which is why we're doing this conversation today because we want to remind you about Senate Bill 959. <laughs> the United States Senate is attempting to make the same limitations on the administration of testosterone that they did on mm-hmm. growth, growth hormones hormone. in 1993. So if you don't want that to happen, you need to contact your senator and say, I am opposed to this Senate bill. Please take a look mm-hmm. at this. Please be aware of this. Please don't do this. And if you have a parent who's aging, yeah. then if you don't want to be taking care of them for the next 10 or 15 years, I'm <laughs> That's serious. That's a heck of a message. If you well, don't if have you, to take care of your you old love, mother. No, if you love your parent and you want them to be well until they die, and if you don't want to be the caretaker. Yeah. I know, I know. That's what I was thinking, but I didn't say it. Um, if you don't want to be their minute-by-minute caretaker, yeah. then and you wish them well, then they need to get some of their hormones back so that they can actually live that way. My wife has done it's that important. for her father and her grandmother, and it is an exhausting, all-consuming responsibility night and day that takes years off your life. I know. I've done and, it for my father and my mother-in-law. Exactly. Neither of which listened to me. <laughs> They, they, said, they said, you're not doing that experimental medicine oh, on me. <laughs> it's, but, you know, thousands and thousands of patients later. See, that's that's yeah. why I can still do this. Yeah. Every day somebody comes in and goes, "Oh yeah, my life has changed. Not just someone. Lots of people walk in and say, right. look at me. Look at the picture before. We always take pictures right. before and after. Look at my picture before. Did you even recognize me? And, and most of the time I don't. They look different. They look younger. They look healthy. They have blood flow to their skin. They've also listened to me about diet and supplements and yeah. exercise. But now they can exercise. They don't hurt all over. So all of these things make me more than certain that all the research I've gathered out there and brought together is right. That testosterone right. really does increase growth hormone, you, and I test it. You can demonstrably but someday, show them the But somebody's going to need this, and maybe they need it right now. Yeah. And why can't they just make the law that people over 50 can get it or people with a head injury can get it? I mean, why does it have to be no one can have this? That makes no sense. It's the the nature of power and bureaucracy. I know, but I just hate that. Yeah, I do too. It's either either group think or it's individual think. And so, and group think is supposed to be to protect us, but it's protecting us right into a nursing home. And that's all I've got to say about that. And that's all we have to say. Thank you for listening. (laughs) Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash health. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.